that only 27 Maltese children have been adopted over the last decade. Children give us life. You know, it's, 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 it's them that, that, that complete us. It's not us that we are saving them. It's like they are saving us. Why do you think people hold back from going yeah. for adoption? There are so many fears. Families who've adopted Maltese children, and this is an article that was out with the Times of Malta, had their car or front door burnt in a clear sign of retribution, instilling fear in many other prospective parents. I, I, I can't imagine my life without him. So if I have to go through all the heartache and everything, I would just do it no matter what. Adoption, in a way, um, gave me the life that I wanted. Welcome to the She Word Conversations, the women rarely have, but really should. Before I get going, guys, I just want to remind you, somewhere under here is a subscribe button, whether or not you are listening to us through Spotify, watching us on YouTube, or joined us on Patreon, you can subscribe. And subscribing means that you get to enjoy all of our She Word content and everything that's coming up in the next six months. I'm not going to let you know everything that's happening because we have some fantastic surprises, but make sure you hit that button and subscribe. Now, if you are joining us on the Patreon page, Page, a massive welcome to you, because not only will you be able to come to our event next year before anybody else, also you get all of the content before anybody else, and if you scroll through the Patreon, you'll find special offers from our program partners. But more than that, because as a Patreon subscriber, 50% of the profits of the Patreon page goes to the Richmond Foundation to support women who need therapy and cannot afford it. So thank you so much to you. Now, now to our show today. We've been talking about parenting on The She Word. We've talked about postpartum and pregnancy. We've also talked about fertility and being child free, but we haven't yet spoken about adoption. So in this show. We're going to talk a, about a topic that is an alternative route to parenting. All of the joys and the challenges that go with that and also uh, how you can get into adoption. And we will also provide the information along with this show if it interests you to get involved. So first of all, I need to introduce my guests. Now, Dorian Catania, this is not your first rodeo with the she word. This is your second time. Thank you so much for being with us. Women and Beauty was your first show. Yes. And we initially started talking about this show. So Women and Beauty was actually just kind of along the side way. And, and then we had originally spoken because you have an adopted daughter. That's right. And I'm going to get you to fill in on the details on that in just a second, but welcome back. Thank you. I love happy. your dress as well. You're really super bright. <laughs> <laughs> now also, Hélène Mikhailov Avalon is a psychotherapist and her and her wife, Rowan, have not only fostered here in Malta, but you've also uh, undertaken an open adoption with your Maltese adopted daughter, meaning your daughter still has contact with her birth mother. And in your own words, your daughter has effectively three mums, which I'm really excited to hear about. And Elaine, thank you so much for being here as well. And Charmaine Attard Betzina, who is a lecturer at MCAST, uh, who's also worked with the Richmond Foundation and a mum to her adopted son. Thank you so much for being with me, Charmaine. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Now, and before I get you guys to fill in the gaps, I just want to say in my books, I'm going to try and not get emotional because I think that you are heroes. I'm going to start off by saying what you guys do and the opportunities that you give to young children uh, is phenomenal. And I have a huge, big lump in my throat, a huge heart for this show. And I'm so glad that we're doing this. And I'll explain why in a moment. Before we get there, Dorian, just briefly, because it is your second rodeo, a little bit of background about you, but a little bit more detail about your adoptive situation. So, um, I started off the adoption journey by following the course as a, as a single person. 
Um, and what happened is that when I finished the course, I met my soulmate. And I got pregnant with our bio son. And the dream, the heart, the love always remained in my heart and grew with me through the years. So when my son was three, we started the adoption process together with my partner. And yes, now Jenna has been home with us for a year, this month, actually, November. So I'm still living a dream. I, I, I look at her and I can't keep my eyes off her. I have this beautiful Indian princess at home. So you've adopted her from abroad and you have a naturally born son yes. as well. So you have a really interesting family dynamic. Yes. Um, however, as I'm sure my new friends will, will say, when we look at our children, um, we don't see anything different. It's like we've been together forever. It's like there are no blanks, you know. So when I look at my children, I, I don't see like I, I have to focus. And yes, she's my adopted daughter. He's my bio son. However, you know, my kids. I can't wait to talk to you about this. Elaine. Okay. Now, we're talking about interesting family dynamics. You also have interesting fi family dynamics as well. So explain to me your situation, who you are, first of all, and welcome, of course. Thank you. So, um, as you said, I'm a psychotherapist, and this is very linked to why I ended up uh, adopting a child. Um, my, my journey into parenthood started 16 years ago when I gave birth to our eldest daughter. Uh, she's 16 today. And then later on in life, I met my wife, uh, Rowan, and uh, we decided to embark on uh, this journey of fostering. So our daughter came to us initially through fostering. And um, it was always a, a, what we call a long-term placement. We knew that uh, um, her mother would need time to recover before the possibility uh, that the child would be reintegrated back into the family. However, when we met the mother and as, uh, as things unfolded, uh, the, the, her mother uh, expressed a wish for us to adopt her. And we were very excited to do so. It took a long time because of the legal structure that was in place then and the legal structure that is in place now maybe we can say more about it absolutely later on but Leila has um has been adopted uh, for two years now but has been with us for seven years because she came to us when she was six weeks old wow. and uh, and she's uh, one of the first cases under the new uh, child protection law of uh, open adoption so she still has contact with her biological mother fantastic Fantastic. Charmaine, tell me your situation, because I'm seeing they're like these totally different dynamics at the table already. What, what's your situation? So my situation was uh, quite different from yours. Um, basically, um, we couldn't have, my husband and I weren't in a situation where we could have our own biological kids. Um, at one point, we started discussing adoption. I think it was a point where we were both ready to actually embark in this, you know, in this endeavor, in this adventure. We weren't always, I wasn't always ready for adoption. Jeffrey, that came, it was a process where I have um, uh, basically worked on myself and things like that. Um, it is the best journey that I've, I've been through. It is the most... Um, life-changing experience and um, Alexander has been with us um, from the age of one year four months um, we adopted him from India as well um, and yes I have this Indian prince <laughs> <laughs> we have an Indian prince and an Indian princess and a Maltese princess obviously <laughs> We're going to delve into the details of how you came to adoption and the process of adoption and we can talk about all of that in the next hour. But before we get there, I wanted to just tell you why this show is important. And I've been very blessed I've, in my career. I've interviewed probably nearly 3,000 people. And one of the interviews that really sticks out in my mind when I was a drive time DJ on XFM is an amazing lady. I wish I knew her name. Uh, she came from a pot. She was a social worker and she came to talk about adoption. And 
she came into the studio absolutely terrified. Her, she was shaking and her hands were white and we talked. And I, at the time, was considering adoption myself. I can't have children naturally. And I was single. And I said, you know, I really would like to be a mum. So it was kind of a real thing for my heart. Um, and over the course of the show, we talked about adoption. We talked about the circumstances in Malta, as you mentioned, which were preventing adoption. And she was basically unraveling this sort of, if you like, some myths of adoption. And she was talking about it very passionately. And by the end of that show, I had had been contacted by three listeners who all said we'd been considering it. And this woman made up our mind. And what really dropped with me was it wasn't just the children whose lives had been changed through adoption, or the parents, but it's the extended family. It's the children of the future. It is the ripple effects of somebody adopting and giving a child a future is boundless. And that's why I wanted to talk about it today. But I want to just talk through, before we get started, just on some statistics. In order, now correct me if I'm wrong, because these are the statistics that I've gathered from the wide world interweb. But in order to adopt in Malta, you have to be at least uh, 28 years old or 21 years older than the adoptee, uh, but can't be more than 45 years old. Now, this is this is what uh, you'll find when you look about this. Right now, Malta has adoption agree agreements with Slovakia, Albania, and Vietnam. Parents can also choose to adopt from other countries such as Por Portugal, Bulgaria, Latvia, Poland, Chile, Cambodia, and Moldova, which, like India, do not require adoption agreements. Now, I'm just reading what's on the internet because I can see Elaine going, what? So you guys can correct me on this if, the, the, if it's wrong. But last year, a report stated families who've adopted Maltese children, and this is an article that was out with the Times of Malta, had their car or front door burnt in a clear sign of retribution, instilling fear in many other prospective parents when they plan to ch adopt a child and Parliament revealed that only 27 Maltese children have been adopted over the last decade. But as we spoke about Elaine and as I brought from that show many years ago, there's over 200 children in care here. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, so that number, that number of 27 is, is truly remarkable. This pushes many of them not to want to adopt Maltese children, preferring to take longer, more arduous and more expensive routes to adopting children from other countries. In 2018 alone, 54 children were adopted from abroad, setting a new 10-year record for Malta. And in the past 10 years, 235 children have been adopted by families in Malta, with the majority of those adoptions coming from foreign countries. India is the country that is most popular for adoption. So as I said, you know, this is these are the statistics that you can find really readily available mm -hmm. online. And please feel free to correct those through your own experience. But before we go any further, you just briefly touched on it. I'd like a little bit more detail of what led you to make that decision. Elaine is nodding away, so I'm going to let you start. You're, because we have three very, very different situations here, what led you to say, yes, I'm going to adopt? Just to, to So as a therapist, I always worked with children in care. So I was obviously very much exposed to children who could not, for some reason or another, live with their biological parents and who were, um, for many years, abandoned in care. Uh, awaiting the possibility of being fostered because uh, under the previous law, adoption was very difficult. You actually mentioned this. I didn't know the number was so low. I knew it was low, but not that low, 27 in a decade. It's shocking. Um, the things have changed. And under the new law now, even children in, um, in foster care uh, gain permanency. And if uh, the parents do not show any, um, uh, any progress, and, and being able to take charge of their children, then those children move uh, towards freeing for adoption, which is what happened in our case. It took a long time. I still feel it was a long time because a child, um, two years in a child's life is uh, like 20 years in our adult life. Wow. 
and uh, their identity, the, the, their identity and the development of their identity is obviously revolves around who they are and where they belong. So even though um, our daughter was living within our family and had all the safety and security we could offer, um, like many other children, still asked, why is my surname different from yours? And uh, will I go back to my tummy mummy? who's the biological mother. So uh, I also encounter a lot of uh, similar situations through um, my clinic, through therapy, because I carry out therapy with children who are adopted and children who are fostered. So this is why we felt the need to push um, for her to be adopted as soon as possible. We believe that eventually this will reduce this uh, uncertainty and this insecurity children, other children, would have to bear. Um, so as I said, my, interested, my interest uh, emerged from my work. Then I had a client, uh, a girl who was in prison and she was pregnant and I used to go and visit her and she asked me to foster her child, which obviously I couldn't do because of boundaries because I was the professional in the case. But I remember going back home and discussing this with my, with my partner then. And she told me, okay, we'll, we'll go for the course, but we on, I only want respite fostering, which is like a, a different kind of uh, fostering. It, we ended up fostering our daughter and, uh, and after a couple of years, uh, we, we adopted her. Um, a couple of years into that, uh, we found out that her biological mother was pregnant again. So we were faced with a very difficult situation. And this happens a lot locally with parents who adopt locally and the mother uh, uh, ends up pregnant again and is still under difficult circumstances. So, you know, the child is going to end up either in a residential home or if, if, if he or she gets lucky in a foster home um, or eventually adopted. So we were offered this new placement and we were in a situation where we were dealing with um, my eldest daughter um, had just developed a, a very serious medical condition and we were not, we couldn't take that responsibility, but it was one of the hardest decisions we had to make because we had to say no to another child who also, it was also because we separated, we took part in the decision to separate the siblings. My, my daughter has um, a, her, her sister at home, but then she has three other siblings. So, you know, it, when we talk about open adoption, it's something that can sound quite scary. Even though it's more common abroad, it's very new in Malta. It has been, it has existed since always, but before it was offered to children who were um, aged 12 and over. Because if you were adopted at age 12 and over, then it was obvious that you had a relationship with your biological mother. And if that was not psychologically damaging, then that relationship would still hold under the, the legal framework of an open adoption. However, in our case, and now the law states that even babies can be adopted through open adoption. And this was something that um, encouraged, gave a lot of um, uh, courage to the mother because it was, even though the mother could not and knows she still cannot take full responsibility for her biological child, uh, she still takes um, very, uh, you see a lot of uh, emotional uh, connection when they meet. We meet every fortnight, we celebrate special days together, we do video calls. We, if she does a craft or a drawing at school, she might decide to give it to her uh, biological mother. Um, so there, there's one needs to be prepared for open adoption. Uh, what if you could start your journey over? Start here and start again there. That's how life works, in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. So, so just you talking about your process and what you've been going through already raises for me a, a billion questions and we'll come... <laughs> We'll see how much we can get through in, in, the, in the show. But I, one of the things that's most interesting is that every situation that you've discussed mm -hmm. is different. We talk about adoption, but within adoption, there are so many different <clears throat> uh, 
measures. There's so many different situations. There's so many different um, circumstances that not one situation is the same as another. And I think this is going to be really interesting as we work through. So I'm just going to ask Charmaine, because you're, you're looking at me like, <laughs> with these beautiful eyes, this big smile. How then does your situation compare? And if I may just say, we spoke last night and you absolutely broke my heart. You had me in tears. We we're talking on the phone. We were both on hands-free, by the way. And, <laughs> uh, and we were talking about your situation and you absolutely broke my heart when you mes men mentioned your story. Mm -hmm. So if you can fill in a little bit more of the, the gaps, because then I'm going to come to the joys, the challenges in a few minutes and, and everything, but a little bit more of the detail. So I think my adoption was, I mean, what led us to adopt was more egoistic to a certain extent in terms that we wanted a child in our family and we were in a situation where we couldn't have this child in our family. So um, in the beginning, you introduced us as heroes. I really don't identify as a hero at all. If anything, I see more my son as the hero because he was the one that at one point it was so heartbreaking for me to uh, to face life in a way without having the I had this love that I wanted to give to a child but I didn't have this child and uh, it's not easy you know it's really um uh, I mean, you see your friends and you see other families around with children, so on and so forth. So adoption, in a way, um, gave me the life that I wanted. So it's, uh, it's not about, it wasn't about, the initial, the initial schisma was not about, in a way, me giving this life to this kid in reality. It was also about me getting this, family that I wanted. I don't know whether it makes sense or absolutely. not. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So um, I look with awe at my son and I look at him and I think, wow, what a resilient person he is, honestly. Um, because when I think about his journey, when I think that at one year, four months, this boy was taken away from his what was his comfort zone and was given to these two strangers, you know, and we took him to a hotel basically and he was there with us. You know, you start thinking, wow, you know, it's, 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 it's way beyond how children adapt and how children are so resilient, you know, and things like that. But Elaine said something a minute ago, which is really stuck in my mind and I think will stay with me is that you mentioned about two years two years for us as adults uh -huh. is is nothing two years for for a five-year-old is almost half their life mm -hmm. and as you said that time element is incredibly important again I've got more questions I'm coming back to you in a second but I just want to touch base with you Dorian your circumstances because you sort of you kind of went in and talked about it very, very on a top level, a little bit more detail about why, why India? Why that choice? Why did that happen like that? I used to work on cruise ships for eight years and most of my colleagues were from India and um, I had to visit. So I went to South of India, I went to Kerala and I spent some months there. I started to study Ayurveda, I started to study Hindi, which is like one of the, the languages, one of the 22 languages. And... Uh, it always stayed with me, you know. And when I was 36 years old, I settled in Malta. I never dreamed that I would find my soulmate. So I had traveled the world. Like, what else? Like, I, I, I longed for a child. I, I longed for a child and my love for India. So it all made sense. So I did the journey on my own. And then things turned out um, in a very positive way. And as as, as you said, like... As actually as Charmin was saying, I think children give us life. You know, it's 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 them that 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 complete us. It's not us that we are saving them. It's like they are saving us. 
And something that uh, that Elaine mentioned in an open adoption, for example, I find myself nowadays, I still, I'm still in contact with the social worker that used to work in the orphanage. So we do still update each other, you know, because at the end of the day, they were her family. It's like she was raised in a very small ambience of, of, of an orphanage. So the love and the care. So even though they are far away, we are still linked in a way and children do forget because we we met Jenna when she was two years eight months and and in the beginning she we, we changed her name so she used to refer to herself with a different name and obviously now we are in Malta so we have to make things easier for her already the color of the skin is different so we had to, to find an easy name so nowadays I look at her and she goes to school and she refers to herself with her new name it's like wow, this was forever like this, mm -hmm. you know? And and then again, there's, their background is totally different. Where they came from, when when she saw us, she, she, she saw these two white people, and me, I'm white as milk, can you imagine? And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so she, she cried, and she, she broke my heart, like 90 minutes to reach the hotel, and she was crying, crying, I was like, my mind, what, what, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? You know, and, and then, you know, and then the day after she, she woke up, she ate her heart out. She ended up two days sick because of, of all exactly. the crying, you know. So it is a lot of pressure on the parents. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, not even getting there. Because in the beginning, in the beginning, like you have to make some very hard decisions. Are you able to accept special needs? Are you able to accept this, 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 and that? And no, Whoa, now we're going so, into so the process. And we're we're need, talking about yeah. the nice ending, the happy ending, but before that, psychologically. Ooh. So I want to, I want to come back. And I saw Elaine was about to to add yes, in there because my thoughts was where they as they were both speaking about the separation. If you're raising a child, if you have your own baby from birth, you would never let a stranger take him away from you if he's never met him or her. I mean, we're very careful about the the babysitters we, 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 we recruit, you know. If it's grandma or grandpa or an auntie and uncle, we make sure that the child knows them well. And then you, you walk into this little uh, residential home, you just grab this child and walk out. Imagine how traumatic this is for the child. It's very traumatic on the parents and there is very little said about this as well and not enough support offered to the parents when they're so far away and they're expected to be happy. You know, Charmaine and I was just having a conversation before and you get a lot of, yeah, a lot of parents yes. are like, oh my God, what, this is so scary. You know, Charmaine still offers support to parents who are there doing this transition, but children go through immense trauma. In fact, one thing that is, is rarely said, we adopt children who have a hidden disability. We adopt children who are mm -hmm. traumatized mm -hmm. and the trauma is on various levels and and the, the trauma might take years to come out the trauma might come out at, at, at a very young age the trauma might surprise you you know when you're at, at the playground and you really don't see it coming but it is there it is there do you think my goodness i have so many questions do you think that that's one of the reasons that potential parents would be put off adopting because they might appreciate i mean there's a whole bunch of other things that's not their natural biological biological child but even when i was investigating adoption i was preparing myself for a situation of a child that would be coming potentially from a traumatic situation simply because they are not with their biological parent or their biological parent is unfit to parent them so do you think maybe that puts puts some people off adopting Initially, you mentioned the countries where we are able to adopt. So, for example, in my time, when uh, Portugal was open, we were able to adopt older children who have been through trauma. Whilst when looking at India, you are adopting children who are already in an orphanage set up. So, you know, it's a different scenario. And so, for instance, when, uh, um, when we were going to adopt, I mean, our story started many years before because actually we started off by, we were going to adopt from Russia initially. Mm. And uh, um, we were in a situation where um, 
Um, basically, we had everything done. We have the dossier done and everything. We were ready to submit it the following day. That same day that I was, tipo, I had the file in my hands, literally, because it's the, the, the paperwork is, <laughs> is, is never ending. The paperwork is... <laughs> and these ladies are agreeing no, with No, the paperwork is like... And the expense. Yes, but I think the, the you know, the the organization and getting things um, notarized and Posted. making apostilled <laughs> and it's, it's uh, I mean, it's very overwhelming. Um, uh, basically, the adoption um, process between Malta and Russia just closed up. Yeah. So I was in a situation where... I thought I had the room for this child ready because at the time you needed to take photos and prepare the um, uh, welcome. the welcome book. Yeah. So I had this room ready because in what, in four or five months time, I was going to have this child with me. And you knew who this child was? I didn't know didn't because know the point. process was the process was very um, quick how it happened in Russia. Um, uh, so it was very different to the one in India, but, uh, yeah, then it just closed off and it was like, um, I told you yesterday, it was just as bad. It felt just as bad, the loss and the I grief that I went through, it felt just as bad as when I had my first yeah. miscarriage. Well, that's where you told me on the car and I had yeah. to pull over cause I was going to have an accident because I really was touched by that. You really... Touch my heart. Yes, it was, uh, it was unbelievable. It was so, and I think that people maybe sometimes are scared because this process, I mean, makes when, you very vulnerable. Makes yes, you extremely it makes you vulnerable. Very vulnerable. And um, I remember my social worker when we were doing the course. I remember them telling me, um, Charmaine, this is a, um, this is a hard journey. And in the beginning, I couldn't understand because it was like paperwork and getting the course done and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So that didn't feel so hard. But then the waiting, mm -hmm. the waiting, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the worst part of it all. Um, uh, for me, for instance, then when we started the process of adopting from India, it took us years, eh, Jiffy? I think our process of adoption took us about four to five years. Something about the way you bounce makes me want to keep you around my mind. We're going to come to processes in just a second because I want to run through that. Before we get there, Elaine, you shared the background to your daughter mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask you a few more questions on that in a second but I just want you ladies uh, I'm I'm interested you both have adopted from India do you know or did you know the background to your daughter and to your son and why they were up for adoption before you adopted them so in my case in my actually in our time there was a, a site where you can log in and you can see um, adoptable children special needs physical mental and also normal kids um, and you see the history of that person their abilities you know so even reading through this was but, but did it explain why they were in a up yes, for adoption yes yes so you yes. see so do you know what the the background to your daughter is if the facts are true because <laughs> you never i mean with all the due respect, you are just reading what you were given. You, you, you can never be 100% sure. So in our case, the parents passed, you know. 
Wow. So, okay. Yeah, and parents passed, and and her aunt took her in, but the state took her over. You know, you okay. you, you you get to know details and what, what you can ask the social worker, but then the information is is quite limited. And once the child is surrendered, you cannot ask any more information. You know. Okay. This is it. Now I do not know if my daughter will be able to ask for more information once once she is eighteen. That I do not know. I I never asked. But from my end, what I did, I I like collected all the information I could because I'm sure that in a couple of years' time she'll have questions, and I need to answer those questions. And for you, in my case, it's different. I don't have any information about uh, about my son's past. The only thing that I know is that he was born at 30 or 32 weeks. It wasn't um, specified either. Um, that is the only information that I know. I know the information from the... Um, medical reports that we got from hospital because that was what was sent to us and things like that. And that is the only information that I have about my son. So I'm guessing for both of you, it's not really that relevant. It's not that important. Or is it? Well, to be honest, um, my daughter, she was chosen from the special needs list. And um, until you have the the child physically in, in your hands, you can never know to what extent or you know, so for example, for me, the the it was traumatic the fact that I had to bring my child home and give her medicine at a certain time of the day. That got that took some time for me to get used to it because it's adjusting new family dynamics. You know, when you never experienced it before, and now it is a matter of do you know because it is important. So that is something that took some time to adjust, but. I don't think that you are ever prepared and the education and the support that there is for people, for parents who adopt, I think it's very limited and even like awareness, you know, in general. For you, Elaine, you just mentioned that you knew your daughter's mother beforehand. So you knew your daughter's history. I, I didn't know her mother before she came to us. Okay. But I immediately asked the approach if we could meet. For us, it was really important to meet her. And because we're a same-sex couple, and even though we prefer believing we're very much accepted in today's society, we know that there is still discrimination and uh, there are still people who um, find it difficult to let their children go to a, a family who is LGBTIQ. So we really put a lot of pressure on the agency to inform the mother that their child was coming to a same-sex couple. And we really wanted her to meet us because we felt that it would be different, you know, if we, it took us a year to actually meet her. However, our our daughter went to her right after she arrived. So two weeks after she arrived, she she, she started her what they called supervised access visits. So she, she sees her mother, but it was supervised. And we started communicating with her mother from that first moment. So we started building the relationship from the start. We take photos uh, throughout the week. We write a letter. We tell her her favorite nursery rhymes. We tell her how she's developing, what the new challenges were, because there was a lot of, there was delay, there were issues. But we started communicating with her and we started receiving letters back. And then she started also putting pressure on professionals to get to meet us. Finally, we met her just before she turned one because we decided to organize her baptism party together. We wanted to do this together. We always believed it was important to that the closer we kept her biological mother to us, the easier it would be on the child, not on us. You, you, you say on that because I think the three of us are all sitting here. I don't know about you, but I'm like, whoa. I, I, I mean, have to also tough. say that. This is not possible in every case. Mm-hmm. This is not possible in every case. Um, our daughter's biological mother has a lot of challenges, but um, she's a woman who can build healthy relationships. Not all uh, parents who um, are forced to let go of their children are, are able to form healthy relationships. So I also want to add this because I make it sound really easy. We put a lot of effort from our end and we're still doing that. We, we have a, a lot of respect for her because... I'm, 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 I have, I have, a, I have a, my eldest daughter, and I, 
I can't imagine ever letting her go, no matter how sick I am, no matter how how mentally unstable I am. I can't imagine letting her go. So we still feel quite inspired by the fact that she managed to put her daughter's needs before her own. But you say you you know you say make it sound easy, but I think for the three of us, we're all sitting there thinking, no, that doesn't sound easy at all. I'm going to just be very pertinent and just ask you, has there never been a time where you said, actually, you know what? I don't want that contact. I don't yes. want that. Yes. There was a time when we felt a lot of anger, especially when our daughter needed surgeries at a very young age, when she struggled to do things other children were doing. And we knew that these uh, developmental issues were because of decisions the mother had made during the pregnancy. Um, and we would discuss them. We would tell the mother how we felt. We would tell the mother we felt angry. So this is what sustained the relationship because it's an open one. And also she could take it. Mm -hmm. You know, we never, uh, we never made it easy for her. If uh, our daughter needed surgery at age one because every time she got a, a new tooth, it would crumble as soon as it came out. Then we would tell her why that was happening and she would carry it as well. And that helped us. That helped us to kind of forgive her. Not forgive her is not the right word. Sharing, but to, eh? I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there were, yes, times when, when my wife would tell me, I can't do the visit this week. I'm too upset because we would be the one seeing her struggle to lift her head. She had um, these, uh, these fits at the beginning, you know, she, she was lifeless. There, there, was, there was very little interaction. She couldn't sit. She needed physio at a very young age. Um, so yes, it was not always easy. It was not always easy. But then when you also um, hear the history of the mother and what she has been through, you understand mm why the mother ended up uh, in this situation. So you, you, you move from judging to feeling compassion. Mm -hmm. And that helps our daughter not feel torn apart between where she came from and where she belongs. And the bridge, the stronger the bridge between those two elements. In fact, you just asked the question to, to, to Charmaine and, uh, and uh, my God. Dorian. Dorian. You just ask them whether, whether it's, it, it has an impact on them, whether they know information or not. We want to make it easier for our children. So we, we're always wondering, do I know enough? What will I have a reply to this question? Is it true? Is it, is it, is it real or is it not? You know, which leads me nicely on to the next question that I have in my head, which is you have a situation whereby your daughter has contact with her, her birth mother. And, and obviously you've shared details of how she came. You ladies have children of other nationalities who are very obviously of other nationalities. Yeah. So what are the questions that adopted because I know I, I happen to have had a friend who didn't know she was adopted until she was 25 years old mm -hmm. because she was British and she was adopted by British parents and they didn't need to tell her. Now, that was their decision, whether it was right or wrong. But in your instances, in all three of your instances, it's fairly obvious that the, your child is not a birth child of you and your partners. So what are the questions that your children ask you and how do you answer them? Um, or do they not, have they not asked yet? No, Alexander actually asked pretty recently. So we were talking about Alexander is into fish. He loves fish. He loves going fishing and things like that. And he was asking about sharks and, uh, um, basically he was asking whether sharks are born from their mummies or whether they lay eggs and I told him because that was the information that I had that, that sharks lay eggs and he insisted that they don't so we googled I we asked google and <laughs> google told us that some lay eggs and some come from mm. their from their mummies tummies basically so um Alexander looks at me and he goes so mummy did I come from your tummy and um uh, I was in the bathroom doing my makeup because that's when these questions pop up, really, you know, not when you're sitting down and really ready to um, discuss these things with your son or daughter, you know, they just pop up. And I went, well, 
no, honey, I wish that that was the case, but no, I am not your, you know, you didn't come from my tummy. And he looked, but how? Where? How come, you know, like? And I told him, you remember, there is a mummy in India, because we call um, um, uh, tummy mummy, I call her mummy India, basically. I always called her mummy India. And I told him, you remember, we, we, we talked about mummy India. You, ca- you came from mummy India's tummy, not from my tummy. And uh, he told me, but where? Like, he meant, where is she? And I told him the truth. I told him that I didn't know where she was. I told him that I don't know really anything, you know. And I just told him that when he's older, if he wants to find out... Um, and I was how old? Six. He turned six in June. <laughs> so, um, yes, I told him the truth. So I think because you, you, you mentioned um, the lying around maybe or, or not lying really. It's about keeping hiding, things yeah, hiding, hiding, keeping things secret. I think that that is the worst thing that you can yeah. do. Even if your children don't look different to you. I mean, yes, it's true. It's obvious that our children, you know, they they look very different to us. But even if they didn't, I would have never um, thought about hiding anything or keeping adoption a secret or so on and so forth, because that is very damaging. Well, that comes back to shame, doesn't it? If we don't talk about it, and it's the whole point that yeah. we're having these conversations, if you don't talk about it, you're implying that there is some shame True. related yes. to and it. And how can they trust you? Oh. You know, I mean, if you hide their, their, you know, their, their history, how can they ever trust you again? Right. I mean, that is something so, it can be so damaging. To the relationship. To the relationship, to them as 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 uh, as a developing person, you know, then they start questioning. So, what did you lie about? What did you keep what secret? Else? What yeah, else true. am I going to expect? Yeah. So that is where then it gets worse. Um, basically, with Alexander, we always we never hid that he came from India. We always told him, and so we celebrate. We celebrate India. We celebrate the festivities and uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, there's a whole other question that's coming <laughs> up from that. I see Elaine is jumping at the mic. Before we come to you, Elaine, how open have you been with your daughter? What is the conversations you've had with her? She's how old? We haven't reached that stage yet. She's okay. three and a half. Right. She's three and a half. So she's. She's not asking questions yet. And I don't think that I will ever be ready, even though, like, you role play it in your mind. Like, oh, I'm sure. You know, but we'll see. Doreen, I have to let Elaine jump on the mic because she's going to bite that mic off <laughs> if I don't. She's like, as Because I feel um, there isn't enough preparation here. I have attended the adoption course and uh, social workers, the people training us, um, would mention, touch on this um, briefly, but not enough to undo the fears and the concerns uh, potential adoptive parents have. And then we'd be in the in the in the coffee break, and they'd be going like, "There's no way I'm going like, to tell her. The There's no way." What are the fears? Um, that if the children get to know prematurely, the children will not respect you like their own parent. The children will um, get confused. I mean, I remember clearly a couple coming to me uh, saying that they wanted to bring their seven-year-old who was adopted, and they want wanted me to tell him he's adopted. And I told him, there's no way I'm going to see your child. I'll work with you until you're ready to do it at home. You know, and what we encourage parents to do is to create stories. I started reading the storybook, which I created, which we created for our daughter when she was still a baby. You know how we still read books to them. So we created the story of her homecoming, which we celebrate every year. And we mentioned Tommy Mommy. And uh, and it, it, it's like she never really asked shocking questions because it was always part of our story now again my situation is different because i had no choice 
you know, because my daughter was going to her mommy every week. But even if the situation was like, not like that, whenever I work with uh, adoptive parents or prospective adoptive parents, the, the, the more you normalize it from the start, the more you talk about Easier. it, yeah. the more you talk, yes. more talk, talk about, there's no taboo about this. This is part of who we are. This is part of our story. And it's beautiful yeah. because, because it makes us, it enriches, it enriches who we've become today, the family we are today. So, um, I mean, so, I had my 10-year-old always asking questions about uh, the mummy of the youngest. I had the 10-year-old expressing anger because she couldn't obviously cognitively process what we were processing about the mother. There's no way she's going. Why are you allowing her to see her? There was a lot of that before she could understand. But conversations and normalizing it really makes it easier for the child. I, I had a similar situation with, with our son. I was about to ask. Yeah, because like um, we used to involve him, obviously, um, because we got a match one year before we, we got Jenna home. So like he would tell me, mommy, but if I wash her, she will become white like me. Um, like questions that obviously they, they, do, they do not mean any harm, but mm -hmm. obviously it, it's questions that pop into a child's mind. And like, she, she's going to take my toys or this or that. We've been very fortunate. He came with us to India. So we, we lived it as a family. And nowadays I look at them and she's the boss. Like, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and she's a girl. Of pampering she her, you know, even though obviously they fight like normal siblings. But yeah, before... It was a bit, I mean, you think twice because maybe you can control yourself as a parent, but for the for the other sibling, you know, it's also um, a journey on, on its own self. And before you ask the question, and there are a million answers for it, you said, why do you think people hold back from going for yeah. adoption? There are so many fears. There is not enough support. There is enough education. There are there isn't enough conversations about this. You know, like like this program. Charmaine and I were saying like we really should organize a group for prospective adoptive parents and adoptive parents because it's like they've been hit by a truck. You know, when when you come back home and you're suddenly faced with this new reality. Um, there are a, a extremely good books that that but parents need support. There needs to be a lot of support. <laughs> before we come to the joy I'm just going to ask you a very brutal question has there ever been a moment where you said to yourself what have I done oh yes oh yes <laughs> because this is no different to when we had the show mm -hmm. with parenting mm -hmm. and these are natural birth parents mm -hmm. and I said have you ever had a moment where you said what have I done and they said oh my word yes in my case like I I say it now because I feel my body's changing. My energy levels are so different to when I raised my first, my eldest. You know, I mean, our daughter came to us when I when I turned 40 and I'm really living it differently. And this child has many more challenges than than my firstborn. So it, I need more energy. I need to understand better, reflect, discuss with my with my wife. So, yes, there are moments when I say, oh, my God, um, what have I done? You know, I'm too old for this. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, Charmaine, because I want to talk about the process in a second, which I know that you reflected on as being incredibly painful at times. But before we get there, because I don't want it to be like a, you know, a heavy conversation. What if you could point to a single moment or a single thought or a single process that has given you absolute joy in the decision that you made? What would it be? Joy. I think the moment I, 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 the moment I had my son in my hands, everything, everything made sense. So I mentioned that it was a very lengthy process and it was a very hard process. But somehow, when I finally got my son 
honestly, it felt like, I know that it, it sounds very romantic and so on and so forth, but there is where I felt, okay, so this was the reason why I had those failed adoptions at the, in the past, why I had these miscarriages, because um, in my son's adoption book, I um, we have written the universe, um, uh, you know, put us together. And I really believe that. I honestly believe that. I don't imagine being anybody else's mother. It's, it's, I don't imagine myself being somebody else's mother. I can't imagine that, you know, you tell me, obviously, you're not somebody else's mother, but I, I, it's just that, you know. It's so just when you, when you were able to hold, my hold son, him and yeah. you knew that he was yours and he was not going to be taken away from you and he was coming home with you. That doesn't mean that it wasn't overwhelming. Oh, I have no <laughs> okay. doubt. No, so no, no, I have no doubt. That doesn't mean because it was, um, uh, you mentioned that your daughter was sick when she was there. Even my son got really sick. He got over 39.7 fever at one point, which was so, so, so scary to be in a different kind. I mean, if we were here in Malta, you wouldn't have, I mean, you just go to hospital. Exactly. You know, with a one year, four month old child with that type of fever. But there we couldn't. So it was, I think it was the scariest. And I think that was the time where I was also questioning myself, but did I, am I the right mother for this, for this child? So it's more that, you know. Because also, I've just, it just occurred to me in your situation, you hadn't gone through the whole sort of pregnancy and then the giving birth, you were a mum suddenly in a very challenging situation. Well, I always explain, uh, we, we laugh about this because it feels like, you know, I think elephants take a very long, they have a very long lengthy pregnancy. Yeah. Uh, for me, it felt like that, <laughs> to be honest, on the but other hand, you, you know? know. like at least when you're pregnant, you know that after nine months, you're going to give birth with adoption. I have no idea when that's going to happen and if that's going to happen. For example, in my case, um, they changed, all of a sudden they changed the, the law and they were going to stop giving children to people who live together and are not married. So we were faced with this, like either we get ma if we got married, we had to wait two years and we would lose the match. Yeah, so imagine the moment I had the match, I went to buy a bikini for my daughter. You know, because it's 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 like you're seeing the first the first ultrasound. You so, know, but what happened with the law then? Then we had to fight it in court <gasps> in India. Mm. Holy cow! Yeah, so you 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 get to do like scary things, which which scare you off because whoa, whoa, like whoa, whoa, is whoa. this going to 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 turn out right or what's going to happen? Like, because a minute ago I had a daughter and now I do not know if I'm going to have a daughter. So, <sighs> okay, we're going to come back to the process in a second. Just I want to stick with the joy. Okay, because I because I want to just put a bit of a joy sandwich oh. in the middle of this conversation. <laughs> the moment that the moment of the most joy that every you've day, had. every day when I, I knew see she her, was going to say every that. day when I see her <laughs> smiling and happy and growing and every is day. There not, is there not a hardwired moment that you can identify that was just a real life changer for you? Well, through the going to India and, and meeting this this young person, you know, I mean, that is a, a, a moment that you you played so many times in your mind and suddenly it becomes reality. I mean, mm. out of this world, out of this world. You can't describe it. You can't put it in words. Mm -hmm. And for you, Elaine? There are moments, moments where I know she struggled for long months and then you see her thriving, you know, and you see her overcoming barriers and you think, whoa, if it wasn't for all the support she's being offered, and I'm not talking about mine, but mine, my family, the community, you know, so much support and love, she wouldn't have reached this phase, you know, she wouldn't have jumped, for example, or walked up the stairs. She needed so much therapy and she's been through so much and and now she's she's flourishing. I loved what you just said there. Amazing. That was just a... Mm -hmm. That if if there was ever a reason to to give a child a chance, it's right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
we've talked about the joy. We're going to come back to the joy because I keep wanting to make sure that we are putting out the right message here because you guys have a lot of love in your heart and you've obviously had an incredible experience. We're talking about the the downsides and the challenges, but I want to keep focused on on that as well. So coming, I just want to come back to the processes just for a second because you've you've all three of you have talked very very eloquently about the process. I want to go a little bit further into that because you talked about having to go to court. My goodness. And Elaine, you have a, your own challenging situation because you're a, you're a same sex marriage. And of course you were talking before about the challenges of your situation. So just, I don't want to go into the whole challenges of all the whole process from start to beginning, but what, what during that process was the, the biggest challenge, the thing that you would, that you really identified as this is I don't know if this is going to happen. This is this is the biggest challenge. What do I have to do? Taking India to court, for goodness sake. <laughs> that was the biggest challenge ever because you are left alone in a situation where no one can help you and you just need to help yourself because it's your child you're talking about. So we have to take decisions and you have to to, to do something which, which you haven't done yet in order to, <laughs> to bring your daughter home. Very and simple. you were in India when No, this I was happened? in Malta. You're I in found Malta. A, a lawyer in India and we took Cara to court, basically. Cara, which is the adoption body in India. I had no choice to do that. And I was scared at the same time because I didn't know it's going to work against me. And the, the time process, the time duration of that? A week. <gasps> oh, Very okay. Long. All right. That's, I mean, because I'm still coming back to Elaine's two years is the, a they're lifetime. Really, in the they're really fast. They're really wow. fast. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So and then you, you're you, able to go and get your daughter exactly. and bring her home exactly for you the single biggest challenge throughout the whole process so um well when we got in contact with the agency which in the end um from which we got a match and everything i think that um this particular agency was very supportive to us and uh, helped us a lot you know um however at one point there was this um, I don't know whether it was a miscommunication from the side. It, it was um, something that happened with bureaucracy from India. Basically, there was a discrepancy with our son's um, name. So at one point, they realized that the court order and everything um, did not match um, the documents that we had with regards to our son's name. I mean, it was just a, a, a vowel. One was missing, and but it made a very big difference. So that meant that our son's passport couldn't be issued. And so my son was legally ours in around July, but we could go to India to pick him up um, mid-October. Those were the hardest months honestly i i was getting physically sick i ended up in hospital um twice because i had um i used to say i have a lump i used to do this i used to say i have a lump in my stomach but i used to 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 touch here basically and they used to tell me but sha that is not your stomach and I, yes, yes, I know, but I have a lump in my stomach. You know, I feel it, it's here, it's here. It was all anxiety and it was this fear and, you know, and uh, I started developing um, um, stress urticaria, eventually I discovered. So in those months, um, I think those were the hardest months because he's yours, in my case, he was ours, our son, but I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't get him. It felt like so long, you know, to get him to, to, to you, to, to go. And you, you start questioning, but is he being taken care of? Does he need something? Is, is, is there something wrong, you know? And to be honest, that was at a time where enough, it wasn't the time of COVID. So, I can only imagine those parents who went through all this process mm -hmm. at that time, what they went through. Yeah. I, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's way beyond to a certain extent. But then eventually he came. I'm going to come back to you guys being heroes, but we'll come to that in a second. Elaine, the, the, the moment that was the biggest challenge for you? 
I can't point, pinpoint one particular um, challenging moment. Um, however, I, I'd like to share one of them. I remember as part of the adoption process, um, you have to be assessed as a couple and you go through a, huge, a long psychological process. You go through psychological testing. They, 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 they test your couplehood. They test you individually. Um, they, they see what kind of attachment you have, so what kind of attachment you can build with the child. Now, all this, all this assessment was done within the context that we had been raising this child for five years. So it's like, <laughs> we've been doing it for five years. Why the hell are you questioning whether we're good enough parents now, you know, if she's been with us since birth. Um, but beyond that, it was uh, the fact that uh, there is always this fear. Uh, uh, maybe it's a personal fear. Uh, maybe it's also based, um, based on what I've been through as a woman who identifies as bisexual in a society like ours. The fear of uh, being judged as less mm because of our sexual orientation. So that was a challenging moment. That was very different to what uh, the others have just explained. But there was that fear that, oh my God, we've held on to her for five years. Now we want to adopt her. What if, what if it results that we're not good enough and they'll take her away from us, you know? It, it was, it, it was at the same time, it was like, what the hell is going on? Why are we being assessed now? She's been with us. This was also very unclear because we uh, went for the adoption when the law um, um, when the law kicked in, so procedures had not changed. In fact, I wouldn't be able to tell you whether current foster carers would now require this kind of assessment. Mm. So I'm, mm. I'm telling you what I went, what we went through ourselves. That's um, that's it. However, because I don't, I want to balance out things. I would say, and we've been through a lot of challenges, especially health-related ones. The joys always uh, um, the way the the joys are always many more than the challenges. Yes, I feel like we need to do a second show. <laughs> I feel like we have only just scratched the top of the sur the surface of this topic, and it's a topic that I think that we need to talk about for the sake of parents and also children. So I'm going to right now ask if we can do this show again. Yes, because I also, I was hoping that I would come here and encourage parents, um, well, encourage people to go for adoption, not so, scare them off okay. because no, no, of no, no, our no, no, experiences, you no. know? No, no, and that's why I was asking you, Elaine, about the joy. But I think mm -hmm. it is also worth knowing, as you said, you were going into the process of, uh, of this fairly blind and I think it's worth knowing what you might have to face. But that's why I keep having seen Charmaine, seeing your joy. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I can feel the joy of each of you when you talk about your child. So I want to close for this show. And we will talk about this again. But I want to close by asking you to address this and speak to prospective parents, because I really would like to not scare prospective parents off. I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to leave your, your closing statement as something that is important and might even hopefully encourage parents to go along this journey. So I'm going to, Elaine's sitting there at the mic again. She's like, whoa, I'm biting into this mic. Elaine, what would you say to a prospective person who is parent or parents who's considering adoption for whatever reason? Mm. Um, it's a wonderful choice and it's a choice that will enrich you and help you to grow as a human being like no other thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and the, um, she challenges me every day and she makes me a better person. Uh, however, it needs to be taken responsibly and one needs to make sure that they have the right support structure in place. That's that's it right there. Dorian, for you, your, your message to prospective parents. For me, this was the best decision ever, ever. It was the easiest yes I could ever say, and I wish I was younger and I would do it all over again, all over again, in a second. The in best. a second? Yeah, no doubts. I would do it over again. And despite everything? Yes, despite everything. My son is my best adventure. I mean, he gives, it's, uh, as I said before, it's, it, I, I, I can't imagine my life without him. So if I had to go through 
all the heartache and everything, I would just do it no matter what. Did you feel? You no, forget all the heartache. You forget all the heartache. Honestly. That's parenting for you, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it's uh, yes, it's, it's all worth it. When you look at him, when I look at my son and I see him, I mean, now he's six. He's nearly, so my, I, I'm very short, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's still going to be taller than me. Um, but when I see him thriving, when I see his resilience, you know, when I see him trying so much to learn and to, you know, and him flourishing, it's... It's beyond joy, you know, it's, it's. I know you don't like me saying this, but I really do. I really do feel and I believe that you ladies are heroines to go through everything that you've gone through to give a child uh, an opportunity. But I love what you said. It's also them, them. that have given you yeah. the opportunity. I'm going to chinch into that. Mm. We are going to do this again. Can we agree that we're going to do it again? Okay. All right, let's do this again and talk about this in <laughs> yes. more detail. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. That's us. Awesome.